Hello, it is Ryan, and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere with daily bonuses. That should brighten your day, Lil. Actually, a lot. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VTW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. Welcome to the Eric Erickson Show podcast, Hour 2. Hello, America. It is Eric Erickson. I hope you had a great weekend. The start of the NFL College football continues. Tom Brady is back. Don't know about his marriage, but I know about his arm. It's working. Oh, my goodness. Hey, I, I kind of feel bad for the guy. I wasn't going to start here, but now that the words are out of my mouth, I kind of feel bad for the guy. Um, he, he ended last season, and within two months, he's back. He's defined by the football game. And I, I just when you are you are that committed to the game, and you've gotten no real send off. If we're honest about it, I mean, people started speculating at the end of the year maybe that was the end of end of the year, and he left, and then he came back. His bid to to take the Dolphins failed, and he's just he's defined by he's not defined as a dad. He's not defined as a husband. He's defined by his football game, and he has allowed himself in that way to be. You understand why he is a generational talent, but I don't know. His wife apparently is angry with him for going back in. I, 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 you got to think if, if you're one of his kids, dad was home for two months and decided he had to go back to work. What's wrong with me? I just, I feel bad about the situation for the family and also for him being Tom Brady, who he is, whether I liked him or not. I've always liked Peyton Manning more from Louisiana. You got to like the Mannings, but it just seems like make this Tom Brady's year. If he gets to the Super Bowl, win or lose, then you can say, okay, I got all the way back to the Super Bowl. I'm 45, 46 years old by then. It's 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 over and done with. I don't know. But what I do know, I do know this. I told you so. Not about that. Bear with me. Some of you have sent me nasty notes saying I have talked way too much about the polling. Oh, just wait. We're going to get there. But before we get there, because it is deeply relevant, I have to play you some audio. If you want the greatest example of modern media's political bias for the left in this country, consider all of the attacks on Herschel Walker from the media. They attack how he speaks They attack what he says. They attack his acumen for politics, his intelligence, his IQ. Everything about Herschel Walker gets attacked by the American political press. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you John Fetterman, the Democratic candidate of Pennsylvania. This man is running against Dr. Oz And, well, just listen for yourself. You didn't have a doctor in your life making fun of it, making light of it, or telling you that you're not fit to be served. Can you describe uh, a stroke and what, you know, what's happened? So I, I use the example. So pretend I was... I want to go to Wegmans. It's such the most important race for the Senate here for 22. We have to replace Pat Toomey. Oh, no. no. Senator Toomey was not very nice to me. He, Pat Toomey is a miracle. He had a chance, he had a chance to match me up again. Abortion is the ballot now in November. Um, one of you, that's, you, that's, 
the Senate candidate for the Democrats, Pennsylvania, who apparently is winning right now, allegedly. If that was a speech that Herschel Walker had given, major members of the press would be all over it asking about his competence, asking about his IQ, his ability to be in the Senate. But in Pennsylvania, they're giving John Fetterman a pass because he had a stroke. He's also apparently got some massive knot on the back of his neck. Um, Looks like one of those creatures from aliens about to pop out of the back of his head, and no one seems to know what it is. Uh, uh, Just the whole thing is weird. And the media pass, here is why I'm right, and the New York Times has picked up on it. Here's the headline. Yes, the polling warning signs are flashing again. This is Nate Cohen writing in the New York Times. Ahead of the last presidential election, we created a website tracking the latest polls. Internally, we called it a polling diary. Despite a tough polling cycle, one feature proved to be particularly helpful. A table showing what would happen if the 2020 polls were as wrong as they were in 2016 when pollsters systematically underestimated Donald Trump's strength against Hillary Clinton. The table proved eerily prescient. Here's what it looked like on Election Day 2020, plus a new column with the final results. As you can see, the final results were a lot like the poll estimates with 2016-like poll era. So, for example, uh, the uh, Joe Biden was plus eight in the polls. If the error was like 2016, Joe Biden was only plus six. The actual results, Biden plus four. In Wisconsin... Joe Biden in the polling was 10 points ahead of Donald Trump. If you took into account the error from 2016 and adjusted, he was four points ahead. Actually, he won by less than a point. In Michigan, it was Biden was eight points ahead with the error four points ahead. In reality, three points ahead. In Nevada, Biden six points ahead. With the polling error, Biden was eight points ahead. The actual result, Biden was two points ahead. In Pennsylvania, Biden plus five. With the polling error adjusted, it was less than 1% for Biden. The actual result was just 1% for Biden. In Georgia, it was the polling leader. Biden was plus two with a 2016-like error. It was less than 1% for Biden. In reality, less than 1%. And then Ohio and Iowa and Texas and North Carolina and Florida all had biases where Trump actually won those states. In fact, in Ohio, uh, the polling showed that Trump was winning by less than a point. If you added, uh, adjusted for the polling error that they saw in 2016, it would be Trump plus six. In reality, it was Trump plus eight. In Iowa, it's pretty similar. According to the polls in Iowa, Donald Trump and the polling average was ahead of Joe Biden by a point. If you adjusted the polls to compensate for the errors made in 2016, then you would adjust it to say Trump was up actually five points. And in reality, Trump won Iowa by eight points. So this goes back to Nate Cohn. We created this poll error table for a reason. Earlier in the 2020 cycle, we noticed that Joe Biden seemed to be outperforming Mrs. Clinton in the same places where the polls overestimated her four years earlier. The pattern didn't necessarily mean the polls would be wrong. It could have just reflected Mr. Biden's promised strength among white working class voters, for instance. But it was a warning sign. The warning sign is flashing again. Democratic Senate candidates are outrunning expectations in the same places where the polls overestimated Biden and Clinton. Wisconsin is a good example. On paper, the Republican Senator Ron Johnson ought to be favored to win re-election. The 538 Fundamentals Index, for instance, makes him a two-point favorite. Instead, the polls have exceeded the wildest expectation of the Democrats. The state's gold standard Marquette Law School survey even showed the Democrat Mandela Barnes leading Mr. Johnson by seven points. But in this case, good for Wisconsin Democrats might be too good to be true. The state was ground zero for survey error in 2020 when pre-election polls proved to be too good to be true for Mr. Biden. In the end, the polls overestimated his strength by eight points. Eerily enough, Mr. Barnes is faring better than expected by a similar margin. 
The Wisconsin data is just one example of a broader pattern across the battlegrounds. The more of the polls overestimated Mr. Biden last time, the better Democrats seem to be doing relative to expectations. And conversely, Democrats are posting less impressive numbers in some of the states where the polls were fairly accurate two years ago, like Georgia. So what is it about Georgia? Well, in Georgia, Biden, if you adjusted for the polling, was ahead by less than a point, which is where he actually won Georgia. But the polls had him about up to. There was a basically a plus two Democratic bias. This is good for Herschel Walker in Georgia because in the polls that have come out re- recently in Georgia, Herschel Walker's up by two to three points. So you add two points, as I've been telling you to do, and he's up by 5.6 points. Brian Kemp, by the way, in Georgia, is up seven or eight points. You add plus two to eight points, what do you get? Ten Now, I'm no math major, but I am pretty sure that 8 plus 2 is 10 points ahead of Stacey Abrams, which is probably why the Democratic Governors Association is redirecting money out of the state of Georgia, away from her. So how does this play out now? Well, Wisconsin, the Democrats are probably up less than one point right now. In Arizona, the Democrats are probably up less than a point. In Nevada, the Democrats may be up two points, still too close to call. In Georgia, they claim, uh, I'm I'm sorry, I'm 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 this is different. I'm sorry. Um, if you adjust with the polling error in Wisconsin, the Republicans should be up four. In Nevada, the Democrats should be less than two points. In Georgia, maybe it's plus one Raphael Warnock when the total polling average. North Carolina, Republicans up two. Ohio, Republicans up seven. Florida, Republicans up 11. Here's why this matters. Because if the Republicans are winning Wisconsin and North Carolina and Ohio and Florida and Democrats are less than a point up in Nevada and only a point up in Georgia, that means Republicans really can pick up Nevada and Georgia and pick up the Senate. Arizona and Pennsylvania, probably too far gone. Colorado, probably too far gone. But all of a sudden, the edge disappears when you adjust the polls. Now, the Democrats want to tell you, well, there's an unspoken truth here. There's a wave of silent abortion voters, an invisible army. This is Michael Tomaski in The New Republic. How the invisible army of abortion rights voters can crush Republicans' majority dreams. The rights culture war excesses have suddenly put Democrats on the front foot going into the midterm elections. Is an unseen army of women and young voters about to rescue Democrats? It's risky to predict outcomes, but it sure likes, looks like the troops are in formation. So there's a problem here. It's a problem. These are the voters who are not lying to pollsters. These voters are baked into the polling. So do you presume that these voters offset the polling error? Most pollsters tell you probably not. Because as these pro-abortion voters who are overwhelmingly white and college educated talk to pollsters, they're the people who talk to pollsters anyway. And they're still missing the black and Hispanic voters and the white working class Republican voters who don't talk to pollsters. And because of that, because of that situation, you might actually be missing what's actually happening on the ground. As I've been telling you, the polling is overstating Democrats, which means you can still follow the trend lines. And the trend lines have in the last few months been pretty good for the Democrats. But they're probably also about to trend down for a variety of reasons we'll get into. And it still looks like the Republicans could very well take back the Senate. Hello, welcome back. It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number is 877-973-7425. Let's go to the phones. Greg, you're going to be up next. Welcome. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Love your show. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I was just noticing something last na- night while I was watching the football game, and it was a Raphael Warnock ad. And at the end of the ad, he's running around the track. 
and he's running in the wrong direction and he's running to the left. And I just thought Herschel Walker as a former uh, track track star, that should be something that they should take notice of and take advantage of. Oh yeah. Um, you know, the, the entire thing here with Warnock and, and Walker first, I think I should say that, uh, the Warnock ad that shows Herschel Walker's ex-wife talking about the the violence committed is actually a very good ad. And if I were Herschel Walker, I would stand next to a TV running that ad and say, yeah, that that's a pretty impressive ad. But let me show you the part of that he left out. And you zoom out and suddenly Herschel Walker sitting there next to his wife. They, they cropped him out of that interview. Why? Because he and the ex-wife were there to talk about mental health and his struggles in the past and how he's overcome them. Uh, took, got medical action, he's written a book, don't want to stigmatize people with mental health. It, it's a powerful ad. Um, it, Warnock has a very good ad team. In fact, it is widely ex- acknowledged by a lot of Republicans and Democrats out there, Republicans too, that Warnock has some of the best ads in the business right now. He has very good, very affable, uh, very relatable ads. I don't know that that's going to help him. I still think it's very notable that the Senate Democratic Chairman Gary Peters did not list Warnock on a race he was optimistic about recently. And the the polling should have them a little bit concerned because there have been a series of media polls that have come out lately that in fact have um um um, um, um what's your uh <laughs> what's your um Herschel Walker in the lead. In fact, I'm pulling up the real clear politics polling average right now. Uh, Walker has is half a point in the lead now in the polling average. The Trafalgar Group, which is Republican leaning, has Walker up one. Emerson has Walker up two. Fox Five has Walker up three. Fox News has Warnock up four. But if you take the again the the polling problems that have been present in the polls of the past and adjusted based on Fox's own errors they've had in the races here in Georgia, uh, it's probably Warnock up one for them, which puts Walker in a pretty good position overall. And you can tell he, he's shaking up his team. They're, they're starting to be more available to people. It seems like they're turning a corner. But it's going to be a tough race. Dr. Oz is a worse candidate than Herschel Walker. Dr. Oz is a terrible candidate in Pennsylvania, in large part because he's trying to reinvent himself as something he clearly is not. He's trying to invent himself as some sort of MAGA populist, and he's not. Uh, and nobody expects him to be. He's he's playing pretend. It doesn't come across as natural, genuine, or sincere, and he needs to work on that um, if he's going to be a man of the people. Hi there. It is Eric Erickson here. Uh, My voice is holding up better than Chris Collinsworth last night on Sunday night football. Poor guy. He was going to lose his voice halfway through the game. He had to cut out and was able to get back to it. Uh, I figured the the bookies in Vegas were placing odds not just on whether or not the Buccaneers won, but whether Collinsworth's voice held. Nonetheless, you can call me, 877-973-7425. Let me take a phone call before I move on to other things. Jay, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Great. What's going on? I uh, just wanted to uh, comment um, that definitely I agree with you that uh, several of the uh, ads for Herschel Walker are um, uh, propaganda at best. Um, it's it's real hard to look at some of those ads and, and without the context that some of the comments that uh, Walker was making around them. Uh, that said, I still don't think that he's the right choice for Georgia. Uh, nonetheless, uh, we all have opinions. We'll see how that all plays out. Also wanted to tell you that I um, really appreciate your uh, insight on so many topics um, over the years. I've listened to you for a very, very long time and uh, just appreciate uh, your honesty and, and how you approach so many subjects. Uh, I will say that over the past, uh, you know, past year or so since you've taken over the the, the limelight and the daylight, I've seen you kind of move a little further uh, to the opposite side. I uh, wish, wish we wish the old Eric back. That was a little more. <laughs> well, listen, uh, you know, I, I I can't think, Jay, of um, anything. Well, there are a few immigration being one of them. Anything that I've really shifted on over the years, um, but also uh, my job is to keep people company. 
Uh, and this, this has allowed me in three hours to be a little more opinionated in, in a two hour show from four to six on WSB, where I was having to stop every couple of minutes for traffic. All I could do was the news and analysis. Uh, and I like to still do the news and analysis, but I also do like to tell you what I actually think about a subject like I'm going to do now on cancer and the president of the United States. This is a this is a dreadful needle to thread here. But I'm going to do it anyway. The president of the United States intends to give a moonshot address to the nation about the fight to cure cancer. Now this is personal for him. He lost his son Bo to brain cancer. And he essentially wants to marshal American resources to fund and fight cancer, fund, not fund cancer, fund the research to fight cancer. I don't know that we should. And now this is personal for me too. I have a vested interest in this. My wife has not just cancer, but one for which there is no cure. And so it would be a, a, a wonderful thing for me if the government could find a cure for the cancer my wife has. Every three months with metronomic regularity, we go to Emory here in Atlanta where she has another scan to see if uh, her cancer has spread. She has stage four lung cancer. It is genetic. She didn't smoke. She wasn't exposed to radon or anything like that. It's genetic. Um. It's stage four because it's in all four lobes of her lungs. It has not spread. She and Rush Limbaugh actually had very similar uh, strains of the same genetic cancer. He, A lot of people presumed he had lung cancer because he smoked cigars or uh, he smoked cigarettes earlier in life. I get this all the time when I have people over for bourbon and cigars on Sunday. Oh, you're going to wind up like Rush Limbaugh and get cancer. Actually, if you know anything about smoking cigars, it, smoke really doesn't get in your lungs. You don't get lung cancer from cigars. You can certainly get other things, but you don't get that. This one's personal to me. I I would love it um, if we could find a cure for my wife's cancer because she takes a pill right now, and that pill keeps her cancer from spreading. My essentially, uh, my if I understand it, and I don't, I'm not precise with this, so forgive me here. But uh, my wife's body creates a protein that it should not create. And cells in her lungs devour that protein and form a cancer. And this pill that she takes keeps her body from producing this protein that it shouldn't produce. And at some point, uh, her body, which wants to make this protein, will find a way around this pill and produce the protein again. And the tumors will begin to grow again. She can't have a lung transplant because... Over time, as the old cells shed and the new cells with her DNA create, the cancer will just come back. And so we go every three months to see if the cancer is growing. The pill is supposed to work for two years. It has worked thus far for more than five. In fact, she's one of 38, 39 people globally who's been diagnosed with a particular set of mutations where this pill just continues to work. The problem is they have seen people who, when the pill stops working, um, within the three-month period, go from being fine to dead. And we just keep biding our time. You know, for years, my wife thought, well, at least I can see the kids until they get to high school. And then she started thinking, at least we can see our oldest to high school graduation and to college. And now we're thinking she'll be able to see our youngest graduate and go to college as well. Every day is a new day. She actually has a sinus infection right now, and it's taken her out for about two weeks, which this tends to do. If it gets into her lungs, it messes her up. That's why we were so, took COVID so seriously. I would love it if the government could cure cancer. But the private sector is doing pretty well already. And university research is doing pretty good already. We have a sort of Damocles in our house. I've mentioned this before. If you don't know the story, uh, there there was the a, a king 
Damocles, I think, was the king, and a man in the kingdom came to him and said, uh, essentially, oh, being king is a pretty easy job. I, I think I could do it too. So the king told the man, come back tomorrow and you be king for the day. And King Damocles had his mighty sword hung by a single hair from a horse's tail above the throne and sat the man under it, fear and trembling, that the horse's, the hair of the horse's tail might snap, sending the long sword down into him, the sword of Damocles. We perpetually always wait for the horse hair to snap and the sword to fall on us. So it would be a great thing if we could have a moonshot. And I appreciate the president wanting to rally all of science behind the cancer that took his son and behind the cancer that may one day take my wife and have taken so many loved ones of so many people for so long and will continue to do so. I do. I appreciate that. But I also think that our government screwed up COVID policy. And right now there's a red alert in New York for the spread of polio. As health officials crack down on the unvaccinated. And in fact, there's a rise of unvaccinated people in this country because the government spread the message of COVID vaccines so far and so wide as to their effectiveness that turned out not to be as effective that now there's a growing skepticism of vaccines in general. When vaccines in general tend to work, the MMR, the polio vaccine, the chickenpox vaccine, the HPV vaccine, they they work fantastically at keeping you from getting illnesses. You know, the human papilloma virus, HPV, is sexually transmitted disease, more or less. Um, Girls and boys can, can both get HPV. It can cause cancer in both, getting that vaccine prevents the spread of that disease, that's virus, and prevents various cervical cancers, throat cancers, and other things from cropping up in people. In addition to like general warts and things like that, it's, it's, it's great. A lot of people, myself included, were a little bit skeptical when Merck, which came out with the vaccine, was pushing everyone in America to get that vaccine out of the gate. But history is now on their side. It works. The MMR is the most successful medical vaccine. There are people who are to this day committed to the idea that it causes autism. It does not. But the government oversold the COVID vaccine. The government oversold protective measures on COVID. The government oversold a host of measures and the government maybe needs to get its house in order before it decides to tackle a moonshot bid to fight cancer. Let the private sector do it. Y'all, I'm a big proponent of big pharma. I know there are people who are skeptical. I get people all the time who tell me with a very straight face that we could cure cancer tomorrow, except the medical industry would not be able to profit. I know it sounds convincing to people who are too on the internet that we can't cure cancer because there's a financial incentive not to. That's bull crap. Because if you cured cancer, it would prolong lifetimes and allow the medical industry to fight other ailments instead, producing new medicines under new patents that would make them even wealthier. Instead of the people dying off of cancer, the the disease they cannot fight, they would much prefer you to be able to fight a disease that uh, crops up later in life and prolongs you with your family as opposed to cancer. But I know it's convenient and and, and, uh, unthoughtful people who think they think deeply believe that we would cure cancer tomorrow, but for the profit incentive against it. Not true. But I don't think our government is the best to tackle this right now. I don't think Joe Biden's government is the best to tackle this. I don't think Donald Trump's is the best to tackle this. You're going to put Anthony Fauci of the Trump administration in charge of it? Deborah Birx? Who are you going to put in charge? Uh, Rochelle Walensky of Joe Biden's CDC? Who are you going to put in charge? Will there be more mismanagement, more incompetence? Maybe let the private sector do it. Maybe provide incentives to the private sector. Instead, the Biden administration has decided to tax the pharmaceutical companies. 
and regulate the prices at which they can sell medicines that lower their profitability so that they can pour less money into research to fight it. We should not be dependent on the government to do these things. The academics out there, the researchers out there, using government grants on occasion, but also their own research in some ways is already making progress. The Pathfinder study offered a blood test to more than 6,600 adults, 50 and over, and detected through a simple blood test multiple cancers in patients before they had symptoms. Many of the cancers were at an early stage, nearly three quarters were forms not routinely screened for. The Galeri test, as it's called, is a potential game changer. It came from a global research study that crossed borders in private and academic research. I think if the government wants to continue to fund these sorts of things, that's fine. But making the government take over the research and the fight for cancer will only make the situation worse. It will deprive good funding to private institutions that are doing the Lord's work that have a financial incentive to find the cure. They have a financial incentive to take the patent. If the government does it, it's going to be worse. If the government does it, more people, frankly, are going to die. And if the government does it, we will stumble upon the solution in far longer time than if we allow the private sector and academic researchers to do it themselves. I want a cure for cancer because I want to grow old with my wife. I don't want her goal to be to see our daughter graduate from high school or college or our son to graduate from high school or college, but to see our grandkids, if not our great-grandkids. And I don't know that we'll have that opportunity. I hope, if the good Lord's willing, we will. I got a vested interest in finding a cure for cancer to cure my wife's cancer and keep her with me. But I don't think the government being in charge of it is going to find the cure. If anything, I think it will prolong the suffering. And so I hope that as the president wants his moonshot for cancer, it's to rely on the American people through the private sector of innovation and research instead of having the government co-opt a program that never goes away because the cure is never found. We're always one, one step behind a virulent, terrible, terrible disease. Now, we got to move on. But politically, you know, I, I, I've mentioned the polling and, and whatnot being out of whack. Uh, one of the great companies that's out there helping the polling be out of whack and helping uh, Republicans surprise and dominate even down to the local election, down to school board elections, is Patriot Mobile. Patriot Mobile is funding Republicans around the country, particularly in school board races. They're putting conservatives on school boards. Uh, 11 out of 11 is their win record. They, they tried it at 11 races. They've won. They're expanding the program. And they can only expand the program because they have customers like you who take your cell phone service to Patriot Mobile to fight with them and for the cause. What you do is go to Patriot PatriotMobile.com slash Eric, PatriotMobile.com slash E-R-I-C-K. And you take your business, Patriot Mobile, you move your cell phone over there. If you have an unlocked phone like my iPhone coming in on Friday will be unlocked, I can take it to Patriot Mobile. Or you get a new phone from them if you want. You can keep your phone number or bring a new phone number to them. You get data. You get voice. You get guaranteed great service. You can also call them, 972-PATRIOT, 972-PATRIOT. Tell them I sent you. You get free activation, great discounts for your veteran, first responder, teacher. Got a bunch of lines because you got a bunch of kids who need cell phones that mom and dad are subsidizing. PatriotMobile.com slash Eric. Go check them out. Hello there. How are you? It's Eric Erickson here. The phone number is 877-973-7425. Should you wish to be on the program, always happy to have you here. Um, well, I got to play you this from uh, Democrat Representative Sherman of California about why we have inflation now in this country. Second, uh, we dealt with COVID. We didn't deal with it perfectly uh, as a society, and no society in the world knew what to do with it. Uh, and the effect on our economy was that we, we kept people's uh, incomes high, and I don't hear Republicans contradicting that. 
Uh, they couldn't go to bars, or restaurants, and sporting events, so they bought everything on Amazon. And that pushed up the price of goods uh, and is still having an effect. And then, of course, uh, they'll try to blame J Biden for the fact that factories in China are shut down. That isn't Biden, that's Xi. But if factories in China are, are, set, are shut down, it's going to be hard uh, to, uh, to supply American stores. So uh, I, I think the rap on Biden for the inflation is, is misplaced. Oh, that's what you think. That's what you think. Except there actually is a real problem. Uh, there, fundamentally, actually, there is a real problem with, the, um, with inflation and the economy. Alice Stewart short for a number of Republican operatives, was on CNN, had this to say. We are seeing, as we saw in uh, already, when the issue of abortion is on the ballot, it has been a tremendous motivating issue for Democrats and for women, getting a lot of people out, when that is the single issue on the ballot. But the reality, when we're heading into the midterm elections, in terms of the issues that motivate voters, it is still the pocketbook issues. And abortion still comes in at five and six on the issues and in, in orders of importance to the American people. So I do believe in November the issues of economic importance are going to outweigh uh, abortion. But again, this is big picture average voters going to the polls on the candidates that represent the full slate of values that are important to them. Again, uh, you are right. When abortion is the only issue on the, on the ballot and it's a, a referendum or an amendment, it is a motivator, but big picture, people are looking at pocketbook issues. People are looking at pocketbook issues, and gas prices have gone down now. They're still higher than when Trump was in office, but I got uh, gas for under $3.80 a gallon earlier today in Atlanta. Um, but here's another problem. Um, the gas prices could be going back up very soon. With Lucky Land slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. <gasps> no, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.